Hello subscribers and YouTube followers. We're so glad you found the Life Lessons Publishing Channel and hope it's a blessing to you. The sermons we provide on our channel were recorded while I was the senior pastor of Northwest Church in Federal Way, Washington. And our hope is that you'll grow as a disciple as you listen and watch. However, I want to tell you about another resource we have for you. Our books. As a nonprofit organization, we give away our books at no charge to anyone who wants them. This isn't a gimmick or a way to get your email address. We're simply trying to fulfill the calling God has for us to equip the saints by providing solid Bible study materials for pastors, leaders, and, and you, the hungry Christian who wants to grow in your walk with God. If you're interested in receiving whichever one of these books, please email us at info, I-N-F-O, at lifelessonspublishing.com, and we'll send you a book. We won't keep your email address or try to contact you later. Our heart is for you, the committed believer, to step out in the calling God has on your life. And you need to know his word well in order to do that. Now here's our latest video. May God bless you as you watch it. Holy Spirit, you are the one who opens our spiritual eyes. We cannot see the things of God, but, you, but what, we have a miracle going on from you. We ask for that miracle now upon all of us. Uh, Lord, we need hearts that will hear and receive and be soft and obedient to what we hear, with that which is truly of you. We ask for that grace upon our hearts. And I ask for grace on, my, on me that I might bring your word in such a fashion that we can hear it and live. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. How is it possible that only three days after a miracle of the magnitude of parting the Red Sea, that people could fear they would die of thirst? And then only a few days after God turned a briny pond into a pool of fresh water, they could angrily complain, you've brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. As we read these accounts, the most amazing part isn't the miracles, but the doubt that persisted in the hearts of those who saw those miracles with their own eyes. Just step away from a moment. Isn't it amazing? I mean, think about it. You have walked through the Red Sea. You've, walked, you've seen it stack up in heaps on either side. The wind dry the floor of the ocean so that you can have two million people along with all their livestock pass through. And then you watch the wind change when Moses raises his staff and blow the water back so that as the Egyptian army, the elite of the most powerful empire on earth, is coming after you, they are swept to the man to their death in the water. You watch all of this and then three days later you're thirsty and you say, you brought us out here to die. And then he turns the pond into fresh water by throwing a tree in it. I know of no such tree, do you? Like some big old Pepto-Bismol or something going into the... <laughs> That's ridiculous. It, it isn't like it was the right tree. Well, I wish we could find that tree. It was just a symbol that God was touching it, and in bingo, it was suddenly fresh. And then you drink from that, and then a few days later, you say, you brought us out here to die. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I can understand doubt and unbelief. People who've never seen God do anything, people who've never felt him or anything else, you can kind of understand where their doubt might come from. But you can't tell me anybody in their right mind can watch miracles of that magnitude and then days later have this kind of hostility toward God. It is insane. It makes no sense. It's not just simple unbelief. What we're dealing with are heart issues that go way beneath the surface. You know, we don't always say what we mean and mean what we say. We play games, don't we? And we hide the deepest issues. We often don't even look at those deep issues ourselves. We deny what's really going on in our hearts. I think a strange thing is going on in their hearts, and we're going to try to look at that. It's completely illogical that a person would see a miracle of that magnitude and then three days later assume God intended to let them die of thirst. We must be dealing with something more than doubts about God's power. No one could doubt his power after what they'd seen. So there had to be deeper issues that caused them to grumble. There had to be attitudes that blinded them to the obvious spiritual message contained in those miracles. By the way, what would be the message contained in the miracles? If you saw God part the Red Sea, turn the water in, put manna on the ground... 
What, what would be the message that you heard from God? You can trust me. Nothing is impossible. I'm powerful. What else? I will provide for you. I will protect you. I'm here. I love you. I mean, wouldn't you hear that? How would you miss it? You couldn't, you couldn't possibly see those things go on and not get some that message out of it. Unless, of course, you didn't want to hear it. In our lesson for today, we'll try to identify some of those attitudes so we can avoid them. Believe it or not, grumbling still goes on. As Jesus' disciples, we too will face the hardship and testing. Yet, Israel's example can help us avoid making the same mistakes. Exodus chapter 14. What I want to do is take a bird's eye view of grumbling. We're going to just do a fly over here and uh, enjoy grumbling from a get a sense of it. You, you, all, you just literally have to see the repetitiveness and sort of the nature of it to get a feel. This word grumbling is only used in the Bible in six chapters. Three in Exodus, three in Numbers, and then there is one reference they grumbled against Joshua in Joshua. So it's a very unique word and it describes simply what we're going to be reading. Here's what grumbling looks like. Uh, chapter 14 verse 10 as Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And they became very frightened, so the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. That means they prayed initially. And then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For we w it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in the wilderness. Now you can half expect that, well, if you saw the military of the most powerful empire bearing down on you, you're stuck on a little alluvial fan of earth uh, going out into the sea, the Red Sea. Uh, you figure you're about to have your head cut off. Well, I can understand them being emotional. But then when God takes and parts that sea, you walk through, it closes on your enemies. Three days later, this happens. Chapter 15, verse 22. And Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. All right, we're three days out and we're thirsty. Uh, when they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah, for they were bitter, poisonous, some kind of poisonous brine. And therefore, it was named Marah, Mar marar in Hebrew is bitter. Maror in the Passover service is the bitter herbs. Uh, so the people grumbled, there we have it, at Moses saying, what shall we drink? And undoubtedly they said more than that. And then turn over to chapter 16. He throws that tree in the pond, the pond turns fresh, uh, they drink the water. Then they go on and find 12 springs of water at Elam with 70 date palms, it's a beautiful oasis. And then verse 1, they set out from Elam and all the congregation of the sons of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on this 15th day of the second month after their departure from the land of Egypt. Let me just insert a little something here. The wilderness of Sin is not a place where people go to do bad things. The word sin there is the transliteration. In other words, it's simply the literal Hebrew. The Hebrew word is sin. Now the Hebrews have a word for when you break God's law, what we call sin, and it's another word, chata. Never mind. <laughs> sin means clay or dirt in Hebrew, not bad things. You see? And the translators of our Bibles just, just decided, ah, we're not going to call it the wilderness of clay. We're just going to call it the wilderness of sin. So they just, but it's confusing to you. You think it's like, what a nasty place that must be. No, it just means the wilderness of clay. And by the word, way, the, the word Sinai, you notice, is Sinai, Sinai. It's from the same root. So that mountain is part of that same desolate clay-like plateau, wherever they are. The whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full. 
For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Do you notice how we are losing our picture of bondage in Egypt and it's getting prettier and prettier, rosier and rosier? Ah, we sat by pots of meat and ate bread to the full. Verse 6, I just want to bring out verses 6 through 9 there. Um, Moses really brings this thing home. He says, well, God's going to give you food and by this evening you're going to know who the Lord is, and, and uh, he sends quail, if you recall. And in the morning, verse 7, you'll see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your grumblings against who? Against the Lord. Moses says, don't kid yourself. You're complaining at me and Aaron, but God knows you're really angry at him. God knows who you're complaining at, and he has not missed this point. Verse 8, uh, this will happen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and bread in the fo to full in the morning. For the Lord hears your grumblings, which you grumble against him. And what are we? Your grumblings are not against us, but against the Lord. You really have a heart issue in your relationship with God, is what Moses says. He says, you come at us, but you really got a problem with him. Verse, uh, chapter 17, verse 1. Are you enjoying this grumbling overview? Just a minute. Wait, I, just a few more here. I got to make sure you really know grumble, 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 what it looks like. And then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin, according to the command of the Lord, and they camped at Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. And therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water and they grumbled against Moses and said, Why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us, our children and our livestock with thirst? You brought us out here to kill us, didn't you? Now let's go to Numbers. Just a couple samples in Numbers because there's, there's one passage that's just absolutely incredible. You can't miss. Chapter 4, verse 4. The rabble, Numbers is a couple of books to the right. The rabble who were among them, that means the uh, non-Hebrews, uh, probably the Egyptian uh, who had gone out with them, had greedy desires. And also the sons of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish we used to eat free in Egypt, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks. I think that's a form of onion and onions, and garlic. But now our appetite is gone. There is nothing at all to look at except this manna. Now, you can kind of understand. Every morning they wake up, there's this goo on the ground. It is a carbohydrate. It's grayish white. It's, you, you go out, and it dries in the morning sun, and then you crack it and break it and and. and put together pots of it, and everybody gets an omer, about two quarts of it a day. It's uh, sweet. It tastes like coriander seed. It's highly nutritious. I mean, they lived on that stuff for 40 years. I can understand. It's like K-rations or something that you're having to live on for 40 years. You can understand. You'd get sick of oatmeal if that's all you had every day. Maybe good for you, but man. So they're pretty sick of it. However, Freedom isn't free. How much do you want to be free? This is the price. And by the way, they were only supposed to eat that stuff for two years. And then they were supposed to go into the land filled with milk and honey. And they chose not to. So the 38 years of this stuff is their fault. And is a great grace. I mean, a two million people in a barren wilderness. And they're surviving. Can you imagine this? If you took two million people out in the desert and you lived and didn't die for 40 years. It's stunning. What, a, what an incredible miracle. Well, they don't like the manna and they complain about it. And then, then they weep. They feel sorry for themselves. It's kind of a disgusting scene. And then uh, chapter 14, they keep going. Verse 1, all the congregation lifted their voices and cried. Boo, hoo, hoo. The people wept at night. This is when uh, they have had the spies come back and say there's giants in the land. You'll never take it. They'll kill you all. 
And the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or that we died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Do you see a theme in there? So they said to one another, let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. They want to go back. You see, as you get into this thing, the miracles, it's not that they don't believe that God's there and he's powerful or even that he'll provide for them. They want to go back. They don't even want to be here. This camping trip is not their idea. So the miracles become an annoyance. The miracles just mean they're stuck. They, they're forced to stay. It gets worse and worse. And then the last one is chapter 16. And, and you do need to see this. It's disgusting. And I don't want to miss a good disgusting passage. <laughs> now, they're cha now the challenge is against Moses as a leader. Saying we're going to replace you. You shouldn't even be our leader. Uh, verse 3 in chapter 16. They assembled together uh, against Moses and Aaron. And said to them you've gone far enough. For all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in the, their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly? Who made you our leader? Then verse 12, Moses sent a summons to Dathan and Abiram, uh, guys who are gonna be, thought they were going to be priests, the sons of Eliab, and they said, we will not come up. Uh, we're not even going to obey you. You're, we're not coming to see you. You're not the boss anymore, Moses. Is it not enough that you have brought us up? Now check this out. You brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey. What are they referring to? Can you believe it? Oh my goodness. They're now calling Egypt the land of milk and honey. This is blasphemous. To have us die in the wilderness. But you would also lord it over us. You big egotistical bully. Indeed, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey. You broke your promise. God wasn't true and have given us an, or given us an inheritance of fields and vineyards. Would you put out the eyes of these men? In other words, actually, it's would you throw dust in their eyes? So do you think we can't see where we are? You think we're blind, do you? That's grumbling. Why don't you say grumble, grumble, grumble? There you go. That's what, that's what you say when you grumble. You talk behind their backs. You make angry accusations to their faces. They've been grumbling. What did they predict would happen? What was the substance of this grumbling? They said, we should have stayed in Egypt. Slave masters treated us better than God. We will die in the wilderness. God certainly isn't going to take care of us. Starvation, thirst, sword, wild beasts, whatever. We're going to die by any one of those. We were better off dead than following God, or we would be. God, I think, wants to kill us. Somehow in this process, the enemy has become God. Did you hear it? Grumbling isn't coming out of some, I just don't believe there's a God, and I don't believe he's a mir in miracles. I don't believe he's going to take care of us. No, no, no. It, this, this thing goes a lot deeper in the heart than that. What was the real problem? They weren't asking the question, is there a God? Because if they were, the miracles would have answered those questions. The real problem was in the hidden attitudes of the heart. I think they wanted to be Egyptians. I mean, after all, they'd been living there for 430 years. How long has America been a nation? 200. They had been in Egypt Twice as long as we've been a nation. So I mean they were Egyptians and they were assimilating into Egypt. When they prayed to God for help what they wanted was him to cause Pharaoh to lighten up. They didn't want to leave. They wanted it simply to be nice there. This leaving the place was not what they expected. And I think they didn't like God. The fact that he's holy. And wanted them to be holy. You know that's the most offensive part of God. Is his holiness. God is a person with a character. And with a personality. And with a standard of behavior that he likes. And it's called holy. 
And the Egyptian gods, they were cool. I mean, you just made the right sacrifices and they would do for you and give you what you wanted. Nobody today ever does that. But God, he wants you to join his party. I mean, you suddenly got to go and become a nation so a savior can be born. Oh, well. And this God is, believes in sexual purity. He's got these Ten Commandments. You can't steal. You can't lie. You can't bear false witness. You can't, you can't uh, uh, dishonor your father or mother. I mean, this is really restrictive. I can't even covet. But I guarantee you, if, there was, if, if God would just make it the Nine Commandments, <laughs> I'm serious. I believe he would be very, very popular today. It's the sexual one that gets everybody. The Egyptian gods were just... So understanding. And, and, and they just understood. We're all red-blooded Egyptians. And then God comes along and says, one man, one woman, only after you're married and nobody else. I mean, what a limiting God he is. Doesn't seem to understand our situation. I don't think they liked what they were getting. They were on a forced exodus out in the wilderness with a God who's making them be holy. They don't like the whole thing. God, and then they didn't want to be trained in the wilderness to grow in faith. Who does? I mean, they're being forced. What's the wilderness about? It's putting them in situations of testing where they're being forced to trust God and obey him and grow in their faith. Situation after situation. They're to come to him in faith. He's going to answer them. They'll see the miracle. Their faith will grow. They'll go on to the next one until they're strong enough to be warriors and go in and possess their promised land. Do you know that God can't give you your promises if you're not strong enough to hold them? The devil's there. There's this, you're on planet Earth. You're not in heaven yet. And this is a battlefield, and this is a, this is a difficult situation. He can't just hand you your promise. You've got to possess your promise. And that's why so many of us miss it. So many people... Say, oh, God, I had prophecies over me years ago, but none of them have come to pass. Like there's some sort of magical, fatalistic statement. No, God's telling you what he wants to do with you. But you and I, if we refuse to learn faith, if we refuse every test that comes, we fail. Don't you dare point the finger at God someday and say, you failed me. No, no, you failed him. And it comes down to this. We grumble and we refuse to be pushed into faith. We refuse to step out in those scary, awkward, uncomfortable, dangerous situations. Don't we? Come on. We do. The, all of us. Walking in faith is uncomfortable. It's awkward. I hate it. I mean, I'm not really kidding. It all... <sighs> A little while ago, I went through a sort of a personal thing where the Lord let me know that he was going to really refashion the, the whole church. That he was going to not only remodel the building, he was going to remodel the staff, he was going to remodel the congregation, he was going to remodel the way we do ministry. And I thought to myself, am I old enough to just coast to the end and drift off because I know what we're talking about. We're talking about remodeling me, and as among, first of all. And, and, and I thought, I don't want to go through another growth step. Am I big enough? Do I, I have to grow some more? You know, I, I'm, I'm kidding in a sense, but I'm not. See, I really know what this is talking about. I know that growing is painful in a certain sense. I also know I'm extremely grateful once I've gone through the lesson, but it's afterwards I'm grateful, not in the middle of it. And I had a kind of a moment where I thought, I know pastors that just cruise to the end and everything sort of dies slowly, you know, and they jump off and retire. Can I do that? And then my heart said, no, I can't do that. All right. We're going to grow. Let's do it. Is this, this must bless the father's heart to have such a son. 
you know. You read about Spurgeon, you read about these great men, and then you... Okay. <laughs> At least I said okay. F freedom and growth isn't free. The wilderness has a purpose. And Israel is saying fundamentally, look, we don't want to do this. We want comfort and the security that we had, even in bondage. Yes, we were slaves to some degree, but we had at least onions and melons in, uh, in our slavery, and, and it was kind of more peaceful, more orderly. You've got us out here having to believe you for water, for food, for protection. I mean, we're, this, you know, this is much more awkward. We would rather be back in the security of bondage than in the pain of the wilderness. Can you relate to that? I mean, have you heard those same pressures pull on you? Do I really want to do this? Do I want to pay the price? Do I want to grow this much? Am I willing to become the person God's calling to me to be enough to pay the price that's going to be required of me? Don't tell me you haven't probably assessed the cost. Their answer is, I don't want to. So the miracles aren't some kind of faith builder for them. The miracles are annoying, going, oh man, we're stuck. They, weren't, they were physical, but not spiritual children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were men and their, and their wives were women who walked in faith. God would say to Abraham, now I want you to leave your beautiful family estate in Ur of the Chaldees and head out. And I'm not even going to tell you where you're going. Just when you get there, I'll let you know. Now would you do that? I can't imagine that Abraham isn't, when he started up the, the, the Euphrates River or the Tigris, I don't know which one, you remember which, which one, did, which one's on the, never mind. <laughs> and he heads this thing up and he's, he's walking up and I can't imagine him not saying, what am I doing? Leaving, a, I'm, the, I'm the inheritor of a wealthy estate. This beautiful fields and this home and all of these things are mine. And I'm going where? I don't even know. Can't imagine Sarah not saying, he, he said what honey? <laughs> Tell me again, I need to hear this. As they're walking. But these, but, but the Bible says, even when he got to the land of promise, he lived in it as a sojourner, meaning a, a visitor. He didn't look around and say, this is mine. He lived there like he was camping there, just passing through. Because it says he was looking for a city not made with hands, whose builder and maker is God. What's that mean? He wanted eternal life. Abraham knew that this world did not hold the final answer for him. No matter how much was given to him, what he wanted was eternal life. That's the kind of fathers and mothers that these people had. That's why they were even a nation. That's why anything of this is going on. And you had that kind of men and women to whom God says, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to make a nation out of you. You're my kind of people. And yet, many of them weren't like that at all at this point. They... They weren't willing to be obedient. They weren't willing to listen. God's goal was freedom, not bondage. And his goal was, now hang on. He said, I know I'm taking you out of Egypt and I'm taking you into the wilderness, but I'm going to be with you. Isn't that cool? 24-7 I'll be with you. My cloud will go with you by day and my, the, it'll glow brilliantly with the glory of the Lord at night and literally light the floor of the desert. I'll be with you all the time. You see, God really thinks that the deepest pleasure for us of all, the deepest longing of our heart is a relationship with him. And so he says, come out and be with me. I'll feed you. Now it won't be great food, but you'll have me. I'll be with you. And they're saying, no, your, your Shekinah glory leaks melons and onions. Your Shekinah glory leaks melons and onions. <laughs> leaks melons and onions. Can you believe that? You probably can because people do it all the time. 
We try to fill the hole with other things than God. And he was preparing them so they could possess their promises. How did God finally respond? Well, let's have a look at it. It's in Numbers chapter 14. This is a little grim, but it's the truth, so we might as well hear it. This is what uh, happened after the spies came back and the people refused to enter the land. And then God said, okay, we're not going to go in. We're going to send you back into the wilderness. They said, no, now we're going to give it a try. And and uh, they failed, and, and here, here's what happens. So the Lord said to Moses, this is after Moses prayed, God, don't strike him dead, because God said, you know, I'm sick of this group. Why don't I just kill them all, and I'll make a nation out of you, Moses? And Moses is still in a good mind. Later on in life, he would probably say, go for it, big guy. But he didn't hear. He's still uh, an intercessor and a, and a compassionate leader. And so he had pled with God to have mercy on them. And then the Lord said, I have pardoned them according to your word, meaning I won't kill them. But indeed, as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. And surely all the men who have seen my glory and my signs, will perf which I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have put me to the test these ten times. God had tried to test them ten times, and they had tested him. And have not listened to my voice, shall by no means see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor any of them who spurned me see it. And he mentions Caleb, say he's a different spirit, he's going to get his possession. And then he says, now the Amalekites are in the land, and they're in the valleys, and they're very dangerous, and you don't have my blessing, so don't, don't go north, just head back south. And then uh, the Lord spoke to Moses and said, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? I've heard the complaints of the sons of Israel, which they are making against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will surely do to you. Now, is that horrific? He says, there's a lot of grace. They've been grumbling a long time. But there came a moment where God says, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do to you what you said all along I was going to do to you. You've been confessing it. You've been believing for it. You've said it over and over and over again that I was going to kill you in the wilderness. Fair enough. I'll kill you in the wilderness. Whoa. Wouldn't that be horrific if God said amen to our grumbling? Yeah, that makes you careful about what you grumble. By the way, I think there's a lot of grace. There are teachings out there that say you get what you say on everything, and they make a magical little formula. It's like a karma, and it, it is an enormous bondage, and I'm not suggesting it. However, disciplining our speech so that we say things that are healthy and right is not a bad thing. Nobody minds missing our complaints, <laughs> particularly God. But here, there is an end, apparently, to that grace. There's a point where enough is enough, and he finally gives us uh, what we've been saying. He says, your corpses, verse 29, shall fall in this wilderness, even all your numbered men, according to your complete number, from 20 years old and upward, I, who have grumbled against me. Surely you shall not come into the land which I swore to you, set, you to settle, except Caleb and Joshua. Your children, however, whom you said would become prey, I will bring them in, and they shall know the land which you have rejected. But as for you, your corpses will fall in this wilderness. You said I'd, I'd give your children over to the wild animals. Not so. I'm letting you die, but the next generation, I'm going to bless them. The next generation, I'm going to raise up in your place. You simply forfeited your place, but my plan will go on. I will raise up Israel. And if you, you're, this generation won't cooperate with me, then I'll take the young ones. And they will. That's a pretty sobering message, isn't it? Let's look at our own hearts now. What are the deep attitudes in our hearts? Do we want to fulfill God's plan more than being comfortable and secure? Because he has a plan for your life and mine. And generally, we pretty well know it, don't we? We have a sense of what we're supposed to be doing. Do you want that? Or do you want to be comfortable and secure? That was their issues. That's ours today. 
Is knowing God our greatest pleasure? Do we have other idols that we pursue in our life? Status, and money, and sexual pleasure. What other things do we try to fill the hole with? Or is knowing him our greatest joy? Are we willing to let him test our faith until we become strong enough to possess our promises? I, just, I, I guess I made my point pretty strongly earlier. But I want to tell you how disappointing and how tragic it is when you see people who come up to those moments where God is challenging them to step out and then they pull back and refuse. This is just a setting of the jaw. Like, no. I don't know if it's fear. I don't know if it's, uh, you're not going to get me out there. I don't think I'm a stupid fanatic like some of these crazy people. I don't know what the rationale is inside us. But it's tragic. And you'll watch certain people have it over and over again and then finally... The voice stops. And they simply become abandoned to, I guess, just sort of living out, hoping, I guess, staying saved. Something like that. But it's why we miss our callings so much. Do we believe he loves us and has a good plan for our lives? Maybe that's the heart of the whole thing. Do we really believe he loves us? If you listen to the grumbling, they constantly said, you brought us out to die. You really wanted to kill us. Maybe it's guilt. Maybe there's a sense of God can't possibly love us. I don't know how to put that together. But how about you? If you understand that he's a holy God so that whatever he would ask of you is the right thing. Someday from heaven, when you look at your life from God's perspective, you will totally agree with God. You will say, oh, your will was perfect. Oh, if I'd only known then what I know now, I would completely have agreed and cooperated. <laughs> because he's a holy God and he loves you. That's the only way, reason we should submit to him. If he were not holy, if he did not love us, we should run away from him. But because he's holy so that Whatever he asks is perfect. There's no sin in it. There's nothing impure. It's absolutely right and good. And he loves us. Then we can give way and say, well, if you want us out in the wilderness or you want us eating manna, okay. And you can put your hand in your father's and you can follow him. And I promise you, you'll be all right. I didn't say you wouldn't be scared at times. You'll be all right. And you will grow. And you will be strengthened. And you will be fruitful. And the day will come when you stand in heaven. And you bless him with all your heart for pressing you to grow. I promise you. It's not a lie. It's not hooey. It's not a religious talk today. I promise you. If you'll follow him, you'll never be sorry. I want to I wanna read you, if you turn with me, Psalm 27. I'm going to close with this. And then actually I have just a little bit of somebody's letter I want to read. But I want you to hear the heart of someone who is just the opposite of a grumbler. And that's King David. David was not a perfect man. We all know that. David sinned and David did some really horrific things, to be quite frank with you. And yet David knew this. He knew God loved him. Maybe it was because he was the least of eight boys and God came after him while he was out in the field. I don't know what it was, but the message went home to, to David loud and clear. God loves me. He's merciful and he loves me. And he knew that. And even in his sin, he knew that. But listen to the heart of somebody. And this is the opposite of grumbling. Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me, notice they do come upon good people. They do come upon God's people. But he says, when it happened, my adversaries and my enemies stumbled and fell. 
And then he looks forward into the future. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war rise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. Compare that to, you brought us out to die. Our children's corpses will lie in the desert and the animals will eat them. We're being slaughtered by the sword. You, you just want to hurt us, don't you? Listen to the different spirit, the different heart in this. One thing I've asked from the Lord that I shall seek. Now, what was the one thing he wanted above all? Look at it. Yeah. He says, I know the most important thing in life. The one thing I want is to be with you in worship. And if that's what Israel had wanted, they had it. Do you know that at one point God said to Israel, I'm going to make every man and woman a priest? He says, I'm going to make you all priests. Is that cool or what? And they didn't want it? He was totally committed to them. He was giving himself to him. It's almost embarrassing. It's like a, it's like a, 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 a bride that's all dressed up and her husband doesn't show for the wedding. I mean, he's sitting there trying to give himself to these people to love them. And they don't want him. David did. David loved him. He says that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he'll conceal me in his tabernacle. I'm going to run to him when I've got trouble in worship. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He'll lift me up on a rock. I get strengthened in the middle of trouble if I go to God and worship. And now my head will be lifted above my enemies and around me. I'm not going to be put to shame, but God's going to lift me up. How many of you are afraid you're going to be ashamed? You're going to be defeated and made a fool out of in the, if, as you follow God. David says, my head will be lifted up. I will not have it bowed down in shame. He says, I'll sing. I'll sing praises to the Lord. I'll cry out. Uh, when I cry out with my voice, be gracious to me and answer. You said, seek my face. My heart said to you, you bet I will. Your face, O oh Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Don't turn your servant away in anger. You've been my help. Do not abandon me. And then would you let your eye go down to the verse that I really wanted to hit. And that's verse 13. David says this. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. Where? In the land of the living. See, we can often say, okay, well, if I serve God, I suppose it's just going to be one miserable time. If I go out in the wilderness and I walk in faith and I take these steps you're talking about, I suppose I'm going to be just miserable and then I'll die and go to heaven and it'll be okay. Is that, what's, is that the scenario? Sometimes heaven becomes a cop-out. Now, heaven is there and I am so grateful and it's wonderful. But David says... I would have despaired if I didn't think you were going to do these miracles and do a wonder for me in this life, not in the next. I know heaven's there, but I'm believing you're going to do it in this life. He brings us, he does this training, he does these things in us, not to sort of make us miserable the rest of our life and then we go to heaven, but to train us for blessings now. How long was Israel supposed to be in the wilderness? Two years. Two years. The 40 were there party. He's not a perverse God. He's not mean. Ten tests, two years, and he was taking them in. He's not going to do any, he's not going to be rough on you or me either. And then he's going to bless us in this life. Great blessings if we'll walk in with him. One last thing. Let, listen to this letter. Just, I'm going to read just a few lines. We need to believe we have a heavenly father that loves us. That as he leads us through all of this, that we're safe with him. That not grumbling in our heart or complaining against, but running to him in worship. And finding our strength and our comfort in him. And letting him grow us to become strong men, strong women in the things of God. This woman has been in our church many, many years. And is frankly one of the finer women I know. But she wrote me this this week. 
said, I want you to know that in the last service we went to, I hope this doesn't sound corny, I believe I got saved. A lot of my Christian life before felt like I was saved for others. You said, you have to accept God's blood for yourself and that you no longer have to die. My mind had been plagued with confusion and doubt for so long I thought I was going crazy. I claimed his blood and death for my mind. I didn't want to die anymore. He died for me. I can say that in that moment, Jesus made sense to me. Isn't it interesting that we can be wonderful people and in the Lord, but there comes this moment when that veil pulls back and we suddenly see the love of God and the grace we have in Christ and the heart actually understands it. It isn't theology. It isn't like, I, must, I know this must be true. I hope it's true. It is a revelation of the Holy Spirit. That's what my sister has. That revelation suddenly. She's saved by faith, but now this revelation has burst onto her heart and it's a whole new thing. She said, I also began to understand that we have to do the work ourselves to grow. Got to participate. I told my husband, I feel like Bambi with wobbly legs walking for the first time. The Bible makes sense now when before it felt like condemnation all these years. But the veil's now gone. To know how much he loves me, just me, has changed my way of thinking. I know God answered my prayer. I told God I knew he loved me but that I couldn't feel it. He showed up at your service and I felt his love. I'm making decisions now with his help. I just want to tell you all this because I'm sure that without your, the care I received, I wouldn't know him like this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm eternally grateful. Grumbling comes out of a heart that doesn't know what she knows, that doubts his love, that thinks he's being cruel. Can we ask for the Holy Spirit to show us the love of God? Can we let go of our fears and any kind of stubborn stiffness with him and just say, Father, we're putting our hand in yours. And you lead us where you want. You train us as you wish. We want you above all things. There's a promised land ahead of us in the land of the living, if we'll do that. Would you bow with me in prayer? Praise you, Holy Spirit. Come now and minister. Father, we, we hear that letter and we hear our sister's heart. And we would ask right now for that same gift, that revelation, that suddenly we would know, not intellectually, but from the heart, that you love us, that the blood of Jesus Christ has washed our sins away, that it's not a cliche and it's not a theological position about why wow, we'll go to heaven, but it becomes reality to us. Holy Spirit, would you minister to us all? where we have been afraid, where we have grumbled, where we have doubted God's heart, where we said he brought us out here to die. He's going to fail us or he's doing this to be mean to me. Oh, Lord, forgive us for the grumbling and the complaining. I ask for it. Nobody in here grumbles any more than I have tended to. And I ask, oh, God, for your mercy, for your forgiveness. It is wrong. It is it is, it is just impure to say things like that. You are so opposite. Have mercy on us. I know you do. You have incredible patience for which we are enormously grateful. And we just say to you right now, we love you, Father. The one thing we have desired that we might be with you in the house of the Lord to love you and to be with you. This Father's Day, we put our hand in yours, dear Father. And we'll follow you. And if it's into the wilderness to be strengthened as warriors, then into the wilderness we go. 
But thank you that when you've promised a blessed promise, when you said there's a promised land ahead, you're not just talking about heaven. You're going to do wonderful things in this life. We confess it. We, we determine to have all that you have promised us. Thank you, Lord, for bringing that in. Just with heads bowed right now, anybody need to say, I'm a, I'm a grumbler, and I am today giving it up, and I'm going to say, Lord, you love me. Have mercy on me for my, for my grumbling. I put my hand in yours and, and follow you again. Somebody may need to just respond right now. Just lift your hand before him and say, I'm one, I've, I've grumbled, Lord. I admit it. It's wrong. I've doubted your heart, doubted your motives. I do not want you to give me what I said that was going was gonna to happen. Have mercy on me for that. But I, I trust you, my loving Father. I, freedom isn't free, and I want to be free. The promised land can't be possessed except I be strengthened as a warrior. I want to be strengthened. And above anything else, I want you. Lord God, we want you filling our hearts, loving us, being with us. We want to bless your heart above anything else. May that be our greatest pleasure. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. That's your prayer. Would you say amen? Amen.